Stand to your feet. Stay for just a second. I want to bless you. I want to bless you. I want to bless you. May your greatest opposition be your God opportunity. Think about it for just a second. Whatever stumbling block you have today, in the name of Jesus, God is going to turn it to a stepping stone. And the further your setback, the greater your launch. And for those who've suffered loss, I want you to know that there's an endless, complete, fulfilling love headed your way. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless this house. We bless our pastors, Pastor Jonathan, Pastor Vivi. God, we bless the staff. Father, we thank you that today is a day unlike any other day. God, you made it. I know two days are the same. But Father, we claim your outcome, your best. In the name that is above every name, say it with me, church, the name of Jesus. Come on. Hug somebody. Man, I'm so thankful, so thankful, so thankful. Jonathan, Pastor Jonathan, thank you for, thank you for the opportunity. Vivi, thank you for telling him to invite me to come speak. Uh, it means so much to me. Uh, I'm so proud of you. Uh, not every decision that Jonathan makes is one like I would have made. In fact, the ones he makes are sometimes so much better. Oh, can I tell you, since I retired, I'm so happy. It just has covered me in so much happiness, so now I need to get on the unhappy treadmill a little bit more. But yes, God is good. Life is good. I just want to catch you up a little bit in our journey. First of all, it's always great to see so many beautiful and amazing new faces. And again, I'm, I'm just here to, to push behind the vision of this church, behind its leadership. And again, it is a huge privilege. It is a huge privilege. But a, about two Januarys ago, God began to speak to my heart and reminded me of something ridiculous that he had promised me and asked me and asked us to do. You see, God called us to do something incredible and amazing and beyond what we were ever going to be capable of doing ourselves only because one day we wanted to give it all away. Now, how many of you guys know that's real easy to say, God, I'll give you anything you want when you got nothing, right? But when you got a something, something, all of a sudden the negotiation sets in, but God put it in our heart and we haven't looked back. And so we decided that we were going to retire as pastors. Yes, it took me six months to say the word retired as lead pastors. Uh, I'm over it now. It feels real good. I wear it well. And again, on all those things, just the moment, for six weeks after I turned it over, I went into the darkest, most difficult, painful season of my life. For six weeks, just to drive to church, it was all I could do to see through the tears. And in the moments, like, God, who are you? What are you doing? What have I done? You see, one out of six days, I knew, I knew, gonna shout out that I had hit the sweet spot. You ever play baseball? You know that moment when you hit the, the ball in the right place on the bat, and you don't even got to look? I didn't play softball so I could run around the bases. I played softball so I could hit it over the fence. Because in dull softball, you just get to sit down. You don't got to run. That's a great deal. When you hit that spot on the bench, it's just a spot on the bat. It's like, I can sit down now. But I walked through something, and the reason I'm sharing that with you is because sometimes obedience in its very act is not always obvious of what God's outcome is intended. You know, Pastor Jonathan has been in this great series called Invest. And he opened it, and again, this is my rock skipping along the water. These are just some of my takeaways. I hope that you've gotten this and more. And, of course, the series are available to you. And if you don't go back and re-listen to something, I'll tell you something. God, if he says it once, it's worth hearing a second time. But when he talked about investing in ourselves, what things do we need to invite into our life, and what things do we need to uninvite? Talk about investing in our relationship with God. And in investing what does it take in investing in others? You know, one week he, he talked and really challenged us about the issue of prayer. And listen, there are 42 different types of prayer in the Bible. And Jonathan compelled us as a congregation to pray for each other. And the magical moving of what happens in our heart when we pray for somebody is getting help, but to love them and the changes that begin to take place. 
in this particular prayer, we pray for other people. We get to see God's love for us, and we get to see God's love for others. It changes us. Yes, there's prayers of salvation, and there's prayers for unique miracles, and there's a bazillion other prayers. What he was challenging was to invest in each other. And I hope you pray for your pastor, because I'll tell you this. I've been all over the world. I've done some crazy, amazing things. I've done some foolish ones, too. I'm not going to lie, they were fun for a little bit. But there is no single job on the face of the earth that is more painful, more difficult, more rewarding, more satisfying, and more overwhelming than a lead pastor in a local church. I don't miss worrying about your eternal perpetuity. If I say something wrong, guess what? You just got a spirit of mean and stupid, and I get to move on my day. I don't have to worry about the hateful email. Jonathan can send those to me if he wants to, but I haven't checked my email for six months. And I do love you, and I do care about you, but I want you to know, Renee, my purpose here is to get behind this couple. Do you believe that? It's so nice praying for somebody else on the way to church and not praying for me. I'm serious. And then this Jonathan really challenges us to invest in each other. And last week he challenged us to invest in our own church family. And if you aren't serving someplace in the church, you're missing. Now listen, there are a unique group of people, and I'll address this later, that you have a very specific purpose. But 99.9% .9 of us need to be involved serving somewhere in the class. Let me tell you about my four and five-year-olds from last Wednesday. Let me tell you what they said about you. Neil, uh, can I say his name? <laughs> oh, Neil, he had a car out, and it was in his mouth, and, and he was racing it all over the place. We had some free time before class was getting started. And Neil was just taking that, and he was just driving over other people's bodies. Hey, Neil, listen, listen, second time I've told you, buddy. No crashing the car into other people without their permission. If you do it again, I'm going to take that car away from you, Neil. Neil looked at me. True. I said, how about you mind your own business? <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Here we go. Well, Neil, you know what? Not only am I going to take that car for 60 seconds until you apologize, until you recognize other people's bodies are not a racetrack. But I may hold on to another 60 seconds. You know why? Because that's a Ford, man. <laughs> Look at that. So by the end of class, Neil and I, we were tight, sensitive, sweet kids. And I just want to say that to the dudes, because you know what? Little dudes like dudes. I mean, granted, I want to pinch their little tweet cheeks sometimes. But man, to see the love of God at work when you greet somebody at the door, when you serve behind the scenes. I mean, you don't know how crazy and how amazing the people are. They never know what's going to happen, but are you ready for anything? It's like, is the preacher going to go this way, this way? Is he on the camera? Where'd he go? <laughs> Just want you to know I appreciate you on camera. <laughs> I see you. Those in the production. When Jonathan encourages us, but I want to bring a message to you today because some of you, you're missing an opportunity to invest and give in. You know, when you give in to something... It does a couple things. In 1 Corinthians, and you can look it up later, it's on 2 Corinthians, rather, chapter 8, verse 7. It says, listen, I know you're doing good in faith. And just like you're growing in knowledge, and just like you're growing in, in all these areas of faith, make sure that you excel in the gift of giving. Stop looking at my shoe. I know it's untied. I know it's like the thing was like, I can't look. And I can't look away. You'll get used to it. But excel in this gift of giving. I want to jump to a verse, John. It's the, uh, I'm going to go to the very end. I love this verse because I just, I want to get there and I want to make sure I say this. But in 1 John 4, 18, let me just read it to you. There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. 
before we talk about your checkbook, your wallet, your billfold, investing, giving, time, talents, and resources, I want you to know something. That when the natural and the supernatural collide, you will draw from one of two different resources. One is faith. The other is fear. And I want you to know, according to this passage, God's own word, those two cannot occupy the same space. You cannot be in fear and be in faith at the same time. And I want to encourage you today as we go through this and as we talk about investing, as we talk about giving in, what is fueling you? I felt like that was a prophetic word earlier. Whatever the biggest thing is holding you back is going to be the greatest opportunity of your future. And many of us, it's going to be money. Right? But money is simply a tool. But as we go through this teaching and I share just a couple really simple thoughts for you. I want to make sure that whenever the enemy comes in, man, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't give that. You can't go about that. If the enemy comes in, I want you to know that you will either be driven by the fuel of fear or by faith. And, And by the way, something to think about. Faith pleases God. The Bible says without faith. It's impossible to please God. I like making God happy. You know, I don't think God's ever had a bad day. I think I came close to running it for him a couple times. But God's in a good place. He's having a good day. It's a nice day. And he's looking who he can pour out those blessings on. You know, everyone has a spiritual gift. And then signed by scripture. And that spiritual gift, okay, I'm just going to tell you, it's how we move the ball forward in eternity. Your gifting from God is how you take the natural things and you move them into eternity. Your spiritual gifts, number one thing you're supposed to move in eternity, are people, our family. And you know, as, as I was in class this last week, it's funny because I was talking to a couple of the other kids. I said, hey, listen, you guys know there's bad words, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, just between us, who says more bad words, Mommy. Or daddy, I'm telling you, missing it if you're not in the kids' class. You'll learn everything. <laughs> well, Kate and Michael said, definitely mommy. <laughs> Camden said, oh, it's got to be my dad. Oh, wait, that was Thanksgiving. We had an early Thanksgiving at our house yesterday. Sorry, I got that mixed up with class. Those are my grandkids. That's my son and daughter they were talking about. <laughs> I think Caden was right, though. <laughs> James like, <laughs> but when we take this outrageous love of God and we make it tangible, why is it so hard to talk about money? Why is it so difficult? Well, because a lot of times there's an embarrassment, there's a frustration, or there's the history. The worst of the worst is the borrowed history. Well, I tell you why I have a problem with ministries of money. Because I knew a guy who knew a girl who knew a couple. And you know what they did? At that moment, I don't even care. You know, there was one time, one dude, I saw him, and <laughs> gave his life to Jesus, was on top of things. And I just, I just told him, I just, I just called it. Things I can't say from the pulpit then, I'm saying it now. I was like, dude, I miss you at church. We played softball together. Incredible guy, nice guy. And uh, I was like, what's church? She's like, well, man, you know, preachers always get airplanes. Why does it always come back to this stupid plane? Right? Well, preachers get airplanes. Dude, we go to destiny. As I tell you what your problem is, you're either smoking it or you're drinking it and you're embarrassed about something. And I want you to know that God's not saying, Ronnie's saying, come. You got the whole message wrong. He's like, yeah, you're right. I'll be there, son. He never saw him again. I could have probably said it different. Right? God told me you're smoking weed and boozing it up. Services at 9 and 11. <laughs> Bring your friends. It was more gracious than that. When we use our gifts and we walk in faith, those are the moments that we reflect Jesus the most. The most. The world is ugly. Believers shouldn't be a blemish. One of the coolest stories in the Bible, I love this. 
I heard a pastor preach on this once. I'm like, man, I'm so stealing that. John chapter 12, verse 1. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he'd raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas, the disciple who would soon betray Jesus, said, that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor, because he was a thief. Man, how'd you like to be Judas? People have been talking about you for the last 2,000 some years. Oh, the thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some from him. So here's a year's worth of wage that has a questionable history, how it was acquired. That really was so outlandish and so lavish. And here we see not somebody that was just walking in the grace of giving, but somebody that's illustrating the supernatural gift of giving. There are some in the body of Christ who they are called to generate the resources. Because for those of us who feel burdened by that and overwhelmed by that, we are sick of the reality that money is used as an excuse. We wake up. How can I bring more money into the gospel? We're curious. We're investing. We're excited that when there is a payout, let me tell you something. We invest in a lot of ministries. This is my church home. And I will always start with my home. I can't write that check fast enough. And I don't sit there and struggle with small, minimal math. I'll round up because I want to see the capability of God. Every person just played their part. But you know what? I'm a little selfish. You know that song? Can I just say something? That song that says, I don't want your blessings. I whisper, but I do. No, I get that. The whole premise of the song is everything that we need is at the feet of Christ. A beautiful song. Beautifully orchestrated. But I smile to myself like, Jesus, I want to be at your feet. I don't need anything else. But I want blessings because you know why? The Bible says I'm blessed to be a blessing. So I want big blessings. I want stupid blessings. I wake up every day and I tell God, God, I need to be rich. Stupid, crazy money kind of rich. And it's not because I need another thing. It's because I believe in this gospel. I believe in this church called Destiny. And I'll tell you something, nothing in the community brings any lasting effect that doesn't come through the church. I can't wait to write that. I can't wait to do that. So here's somebody that did something just outlandish. You know, when we use our spiritual gifts, those are the moments that we reflect the Savior the most. Think about that moment. She washed Jesus' feet before Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. She was preparing him for burial. Jesus was getting his kids ready for a resurrection. But when two people walked out of that room that day, two of them smelled like Jesus. Jesus and the one that used her hair to wipe his feet. When we use our gifts, our talents, and our resources, those are the moments that we reflect the very essence of a Savior. And the power of his word. I think, <laughs> I think about, wouldn't you love to have all the money that you spend on stupid? Never spend money on stupid? Right? You know, it, it, lust is not specific to a sexual sin. I mean, come on, guys. Can we just be dudes for a minute? Like, oh, baby, look over here on page 18. Look at this beauty in the Best Buy ad, Black Friday. Mmm. I need to see you in my living room. <laughs> the guys are not laughing. The girls have nervous chuckles. You know what the dudes are like? Can we just get to the altar call, man? Can we just, can we just get to No. No, it, it doesn't matter if it's shoes or what it is, but we find ourselves, James says, the reason that we don't have some of the things we really need, that we really want, because you ask for the wrong intention, with the wrong motives, sometimes you just need to put things on pause. 
I upset the most amazing group of people that I've ever been in an audience with. Because I told them, and these are people you would know 12 out of 12 that sat on this particular board. Because I told them, they, they had some questions about my history and, and some of the things that we'd seen God do. And they asked, if, you know, this, this, and this. And I just said, I want you guys to know something. God's not going to answer every one of your prayers. Oh, no. Well, no, 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 I didn't say that. Yeah, I said that. You know why? Because sometimes God has something better. You want those shoes? Say, God, bless me with those shoes. If not those, something better. Learn to wait. Learn to see. Because I'll tell you right now, the purchases and the financial things, and again, for me, remember, giving is a gift. I love to give. I don't expect everybody to, to wake up and think about the same things I do. We're all called to walk in that gift of giving. But, man, if you're here today and you're like me, you're wondering, how are you going to get there? I'll tell you right now, it's practice. It's absolutely practice. Poverty. Oh, man. Can I show you guys a picture real quick? So Renee and I launched our ministry about a year ago. We started our business. This is one of our latest business ventures. Now, you're two kinds of people. You're thinking, did anybody die in that tornado? Or some of you guys are looking, hey, I bet there's something to that chair. Some guy's like, hey, see that Coleman chest up there? Can I have that? This is one of the things that we do in one of our businesses. We, we, we buy houses at auction, and we refurbish them, we flip them, we rent them, we do rent to own. This, though, told a story. I stopped counting at 130 cubic yards of trash. A man moved from another country in the 50s, miraculously found himself in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He was living the dream. He began to acquire some things. His son was not in a place where he appreciated his father's work. Every house that I go into of the nine so far, we found out that there is usually an addiction where somebody has had something really bad. This one was gambling. How do I know? I read through all that trash. Amazing stories. And in this, in this scenario, when we walked through this, it told a story about and how this dude that had a great dad who did all these things, all of a sudden didn't do anything. He died young, left it to her daughter, left it to his daughter, and she lived in poverty. Thank you, guys. I want to present to you a definition of poverty. Among many that are out there, poverty is the inability to give anything or the unwillingness. Can I just say it? And you see so many people, that, I mean, there's so much stuff there that could have been worth. I did find a bag of money. My mom prayed. I mean, it's a couple hundred bucks. I mean, it's a good mood for a moment. Especially when you got to spend $1,000 to haul all that stuff off. But in that moment, it's just like, gosh, Lord, people have held on to so much. You know what the Holy Spirit called me, told me they are? He says, I'm white knuckling, white knuckling temporal turds. That's what he told me. I mean, that I'm holding on to something that's not going to benefit me in this lifetime or the eternal one. And I somehow think it's valuable. In fact, some of the things that we think are most valuable in this life are not pedestals. They're a ball and chain. You know, I, I, got, a, I got a phrase for you. If you want to live like everything is your own, then live like nothing is your own, then you'll have it all. Live like nothing is your own, I promise you, you'll be the happiest, freest person when it comes to things taking hold of you. Because, man, I didn't worry about stuff when I had nothing. I sat up in that balcony right there looking through a giant hole in the wall. There was no balcony. There was nothing there. There was a hole in the wall, a 120, however big it is, 60 feet tall hole in the wall. I watched traffic go by just about 14 years ago. And I watched it go by. And I remember sitting there thinking, hey, <laughs> poor guy's lights are off. I look like my brother. What if he's going home? And I sat there and I thought, God, what in the world? My biggest fear in ministry was to be sued. I'd been named on five lawsuits, including a wrongful death related to an injury that was sustained here on this property. I'm sitting here, man, I had a thumb-sucking pity party. 
What are you, what are you, what are you, what are you? Jimmy Baker cry, ugly cry. <laughs> God, what do you want me to do? I said, God, just make it simple. And what I'm about to tell you may be offensive, but I want you to know it spoke to me. The Holy Spirit said, you just need to shut up and die or move. Because you're not the first, you're not the last. But if you want to see something amazing, just stick around. And I remember being free, like, what? <laughs> All I got to do is die? That's so much easier than the complicated stuff I was facing. Not a physical death, but a die to myself. Okay, God, so you're about something bigger than me? I'm in. Yes. <laughs> I'm not going to make or break the kingdom of God. I get to walk in obedience. I want you to know why the next generation may face a pandemic of poverty. It's because they don't know something bigger. Nobody's teaching them to be generous. Did you know that? Poverty by its definition is believing that you don't have something to give to somebody else. Teach your kids to be generous. Proverbs 3.27 says this, don't withhold good from those who deserve it, which is within your power to give. When you give and you're generous, you point your faith forward and you're making room for something bigger, something better. Do I believe in the whole dollar for dollar? No, I want whatever God has because I've learned something. He knows better what I need. Mine is just obedience. Obedience is its own reward. And I want to encourage you today, listen, whether it's your time, your talent, obedience. I mean, I, I know you're for real because you're here. It's first service. You guys are the real believers. <laughs> right? It doesn't matter if it's snowing. It doesn't matter if it's raining. Right? Last confession I'll tell you. The day I thought I killed this church. I mean, I thought I could do it. <laughs> Came close a couple times, but Dr. Larry brought us paddles. <laughs> Beep. Choo -choo. Choo -choo. And I was just a little bit disappointed that they resurrected at certain occasions. So we didn't have really cool phones, right, that updated themselves. And I had got my calendar set wrong. And I didn't change my phone, so I got here to church an hour early. There were three musicians when service was about to start. I'm like, that's it. I killed it. I killed the entire church. Because later the daylight savings, and I hadn't adjusted my clock. <laughs> Everybody else was just enjoying another hour of sleep. Me, it was back to the thumb-sucking booth where I was going to have a time with Jesus like you would not believe. And the people started walking, hey, Pastor Mike, how you doing? <laughs> I'm not good. <laughs> I'm not good at all. Anybody got a message on their heart? No, worst message among many poor messages, I'm sure, that I preached. I so freaked out. Faith and fear could not occupy the same space. The next generation has to be taught. When the natural and the supernatural collide, I hope you respond with faith. How are you and your money getting along? It's a tool. Sometimes you've got to turn a hammer around or stop using butter knives for screwdrivers. It's a tool. It's something that God has given us. And I just want to encourage you today, man, it's not a better place to give. So I've been writing a book. And as Jonathan's been talking, I've been stealing quotes from him. I'm not giving him credit. <laughs> I will on one of them. Because it's really good. It was definitely Jonathan. The rest of them might twist a little bit. But it's the confessions of a retired pastor. Now, business is busy. I'm not giving up on life. Ministry is good. In fact, we'll be launching our blog, lovingpeople.com. You can follow us and see the exploits and the great adventures that we have. If you want to follow on the business side, if you're an entrepreneur, a business venture, you can look up the other blog called whoopoopedinabathtub.com. <laughs> After seeing that picture, you can understand what inspired me. You won't forget it. Remember, lovingpeople.com. That's the important one. 
I'm so glad this is your church, Jonathan. I'm sorry I'm breaking it, man. <laughs> only, only in eternity will you know how great is your reward. I'm glad for the blood of Jesus. It's going to be in several spots in the Lamb's Book of Life. But from a person who knows the feeling of giving in faith, it's like a favorite food that the world has to try. It's like an experience. It's like a song that you know if other people could just hear it and experience it for the first time themselves, they would love it. I am an advocate of the promises of God. I stink and love my church. I'm proud of 1700 South Africa. Jonathan Vitti, I'm proud of you. And Lucas, those imaginary sideburn, sideburns are epic. And Diego, I saw how the girls were looking at you on Friday, dog. Be wise, buddy. Read Proverbs 5, Proverbs 7, chapter 8. Don't be the pig with the ring in his nose. I'm just saying. You'll see. You'll read it. It's good. Stay away from Ecclesiastes right now. But I'm going to encourage you. Only when you step over into the eternities will you see the reward of what you've given. And you will be surprised. Only the things that we've done in faith will push things into the forever. And I applaud you and I cheer you on for those of you who've begun that journey. I need to be encouraged and challenged myself. For those who have never begun to experience the grace of giving, I have one challenge for you. Start today. Start with something that you can assign faith to. I don't know about you, but I had fun for the last 45 minutes. Pastor Jonathan, thank you so much for the chance to preach. Church, we encouraged this morning. Come on. You can do a little bit better than that. Well, listen, before we, before we wrap up, you know, any of the complaints that you have, his email still works, so m.goldsbay at destinychurch.com, all those complaints just send it straight over there. I don't think it's been checked in like literally six months, but you can email away. Uh, I'm sure he'll get to it sometime. Uh, but, you know, the thing that I won't say, uh, like the, the message of giving is so important, and here's the thing that I can tell you. Maybe you're sitting there. I'm a cynical person, and I'm not going to ask for cynical people to raise their hand because I know you won't. But I know some of you are thinking, oh, yeah, whatever, I don't believe it. Here's the thing I can tell you. I have never met a man more generous than Pastor Mike and Renee. Amen. I have watched in foreign countries where he gave away his shoes, which he had to still get home without shoes. I watched him give away his clothes. I watched him work at this church for a year without getting paid. I watched him whenever we needed to take pay payroll cuts, him take the payroll cut instead of the staff taking the payroll cut. I have watched him continually give to this church when he didn't have it to give. I've watched him continue to sacrifice to this church when he didn't have it to sacrifice. I watched him continue to show up and invest in people when they didn't deserve second chance, third chance. The thing that I can tell you is if you're like me and you're a cynical person and you think, oh, this is just something for him to get more in his retirement fund or so that he can eventually get his plane, I'm telling you, you're wrong. You're wrong. His heart for you is for you because giving's for you. The investment of giving is for you. The investment of giving makes you appreciate and cherish the things that you have. It makes you feel like you're part of something. It makes you feel like you're the difference. It makes you change something. And Pastor Mike and Renee have seen that over and over and over again. There's a lot of people and ad that I meet. I still go and meet different people and other places and them. And they keep like, oh, you see this? Pastor Mike gave this to me. You see this watch? Pastor Mike gave this to me. You see these sunglasses? Pastor Mike gave this to me. You see these shoes? Pastor Mike gave this to me. They don't remember anything else about him other than he gave us something. Because giving makes an impact on someone. Giving makes a change on someone. And you and us as a church, we get to come together and we get to give. And it's not so that we can get. 
We get to give because the act of giving is something that God's calling us to. It's something that we get to walk in the grace of giving because it's investing in ourselves. It's investing in others. It's investing in our church. It's investing in creating that. I love that picture that he painted, that two people walked out smelling the same way that day. Jesus and the one who made the investment because her hair smelled like, smelled like that for a long time. I think that when you understand that when you reflect who Jesus is, you begin to take on that essence, that reflection, that smell. You get to see that and other people encounter that. Generosity is something you get that you, when you start to do it, when you start, you may have to start small. You may have to start at the beginning just in obedience. Like you said, you may just have to start. Sometimes the hardest part is just starting. Sometimes the hardest part is just getting over yourself and all the reasons you can't and just starting. And I'm not telling you this because I want a plane. Okay, I don't want a plane. That's not what I want. I'm telling you this because I want people in our community to be overwhelmed by the goodness of God. And I want my church family to be free from financial fear. I know what it's like to be afraid of finances. I know what it's like to be fearful. I know what it's like, and I'm telling you, church, it's something I still struggle with to this day, and I'm believing Jesus. But we, like he said, you cannot walk in fear and faith. It's one of the two. And I want church family who are not ruled by their checkbook, by their savings book, by the debt that they have. Instead, they're ruled by the faith and the calling that God has for them. And the only way that we walk through that is when we trust what Jesus says and we just step out. We just step out. I want to do something real quick. I want everyone to bow their heads. I want to do two prayers today as we dismiss. One, if you're here today, I, I, I want to give you a chance. If you've never accepted Jesus, if you've never accepted the greatest gift, the greatest giving, the greatest sacrifice of Jesus, I want to give you a chance to do it today. And I'm going to ask everyone to just repeat this prayer after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me so my sins could be forgiven. So in Jesus' name we pray. With every head bowed for just a second. If you made that decision today, would you just do something bold and raise your hand right where you're at so I can continue to pray for you? Just real quick, raise your hand real high. All right, any hands that are up, you can go down. Everyone else, let's do this. Stand with me real quick. I'm gonna bless you as we, as we dismiss this morning. Father God, for every person who's here, for everyone who's walking through, and, and maybe, Lord, you're, you're talking to them, you're speaking to them about faith. You're speaking to them about what you're calling them to. You're speaking to them about starting and, and using their time, their gifts, their talents, their resources, Father God, to, to be able to, to walk in generosity or to give, to, to give into what you're calling them to. Father God, I just pray for boldness. I pray that faith overcomes fear. I pray that faith and the love that you have for us overcome fear in whatever area that we may be dealing with fear this morning. We're so thankful for that. I just pray that every person here will walk out of this place knowing that they're loved and that perfect love cast out all fear, Father. We're so thankful for that. Thank you that we get to be part of this church. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.